Good morning, Wayside. How are you all today? Great, great. I want to welcome you here to our worship service this morning as we uh, prepare ourselves and our we are so excited to be able to have that this week and to have you guys uh, walk along with us for this wonderful time. But as we prepare ourselves for worship, uh, be in a, a mind of uplifting, of, of worship to God throughout the rest of this service and the rest of this day. So let us begin. Oh, 
this time, do we have any children who want to come up for a children's moment? You guys want to come on up here to the front? I have a couple questions to ask you guys.
They're watching here today. <laughs> Any others this morning? Any other joys or concerns to share? Karen, you have to continue to remember Karen in our prayers. We have a little great big granddaughter having her fifth birthday. All right. I want you to see Ariana, and she's excited about Bible school. All right. She knows it's school, but that's all she knows about it. <laughs> We'll be glad to see her here and also celebrate her fifth birthday this week. That is great. That is great. <laughs> yes, continue to remember those in the military, those serving, and those who have served. My brother lost all five hundred percent. John Kaufman. Others or any unspoken this morning. God knows each and every one of those that are on our heart. He uh, He knows each and every need. But it is our time now that we join together as the church body and we uplift and lift up all of our prayers and concerns to the Lord now. So let us pray. Gracious God, we come before you this day. First of all, giving you thanks for the love that you have for us. For sending your son, Jesus Christ, to take our place upon the cross. God, we are so thankful for that love. And the ability that we have to come together and worship freely in this place and in this space today, we give you thanks. Lord, we also come before you sharing in the joys that have been lifted up this morning for those upcoming birthday celebrations, for the neighborhood party yesterday, and for upcoming vacation Bible school, and all the fun that comes along with serving those in our community. Lord, we are thankful and joyful. Lord, we also come before you with these concerns that we bring to you today. Lord, for those that are suffering with new diagnosis, for upcoming procedures, for all of the life's challenges that get thrown our way. Lord, we know we can come to you and you will provide what we need through your love, through your care, through your healing, through your comfort, and simply by your presence being around us. Lord, we give you thanks. And God, as we continue to gather here this day, we just ask that you continue to bring your spirit upon us to lead, guide, and direct us in all that we say and all that we do. And as we continue to show you our thankfulness, we give you the glory that you deserve. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. This time we will now receive our morning offering.
Our New Testament lesson this morning is from Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 through 15. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught abounding and thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness in him, who is the head of every ruler and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a spiritual circumcision, by putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. When you were buried with him in baptism, you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him. When, when he forgave us all our trespasses, erasing the record, the record that stood against us with its legal demands, he sets this aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in it. Would you please stand for the gospel lesson? Our gospel lesson is from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight, and you say to, to him, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given you. Search and you will find. Knock and the doors will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives. And everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone, of, anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let, let, me, let us pray. The Lord, may the words of my mouth meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Lord, give me even on the cross so that your glory and not mine might shine through. And in spite of the stammerings of my speech and the inconsistencies of my character, may your word be proclaimed and heard today. Amen. As a seasoned youth pastor, the quickest way I found over the years to get a group of teens that some would label unruly, hyper, easily excited.
disciple, in order to get them to be quiet, is to say these words. Who here wants to pray? <laughs> Over the years, though, thankfully, through teachings, demonstrations, discipleship building, we've been able to help equip many youth over the years to be able to be to, to offer a prayer. It's not as scary as it once seems. But typically, when they bring their friends and they're extra um, hyper, extra excited, that's usually the time when you get those brief moments of silence in a large crowd. Or how about whenever my wife and I are together at a family function, there's a 50% chance that I'm going to be asked to pray, and a 50% chance that she will be asked to pray. And it's not that we don't like to pray, it's just that we know that we're not the only ones capable of talking to God. As a Christian, I know that we are all called into conversation with the Lord, and we shouldn't feel ashamed to do it. Now, what I typically do now is seek those who I know are followers and believers, and I ask them to give the blessing before they can ask me. Whether this is at my house or not, whether I'm the host, I like to help others feel empowered to pray as well. Now, earlier with the children's moments, I know I'm not going to be invited to many game nights, and now I'm not going to be seated next to anybody at a potluck. But <laughs> prayer is an important part of our Christian walk. And so today we're going to look at three things here that Jesus was teaching us about um, how to pray. The first is the prayer. So Jesus, Jesus teaches them to pray. One of the disciples comes to him, asking him this simple question, teach us to pray, Lord. Now it doesn't say which disciple it was. It doesn't say it was one of the twelve or one of the seventy-two. Maybe it was a brand new disciple that they picked up along the way. Either way, which disciple it was, was not important. But what is important is that when Jesus was asked for help in teaching them how to pray, he did just that. Now this prayer might sound familiar to a lot of us today. And for those of us here at Wayside, you may have glanced at the bulletin and said, well, we, we skipped over the Lord's Prayer today. But you'll see that typically when we do that, that means we're having communion. And as you can tell on the, the table up front, we're not doing communion. So we must be doing this later in the service. So we will be joining together in that Lord's Prayer here in just a moment. But it is a prayer that we often say, so often that it may become repetitive. You may feel disconnected and you're just going through the motions at times because you're saying these familiar words. But as memorable as it is, and as I've seen as a pastor, the importance of that repetition and the remembrance when visiting with those who are sick and on their deathbed, or those who can hardly communicate or keep their eyes open. But once you start this prayer, they all can come back. To those both sick with life-threatening diseases, or to those who battled for years with the pain and suffering of dementia or Alzheimer's. The words in this, what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer, are still powerful. So what was the importance of these words that Christ used to teach his disciples? Was it something that we need to repeat word for word? Or was it just a simple statement for Jesus to get to this disciple and say, please pick up on something that I'm teaching you. If you've not seen me or heard me pray this time you've been with me, at least remember this short prayer. Or was it meant more for that? More of a guideline of a way to live our life rather than just a prayer. So if we look at this as a model on how to pray, then we will know what exactly to pray and look at this structure that Jesus gives us. First, he says, Father, uphold the holiness of your name. So from the very beginning, we are giving God the glory right from the get-go. First things first, God, you are holy. We know that and we acknowledge that but before anything else comes out of our mouth, that you are holy. Next, he says, bring in your kingdom. He is asking, God, give us here now what you have there in heaven. Make it be here for us. Jesus goes on to say, give us the bread we need for today. So give us all that we need, not all that we want, but sustain us with everything that is needed. And next, this one's very important. Forgive us our sins. We also forgive everyone who has wronged us. So 
And he's saying, forgive us, Lord, forgive us for all the wrong that we have done and may do. Forgive us, Lord, and in that same spirit, may we forgive others. May we be reminded that we too will do the same. We shall live so much like Jesus himself that we also forgive others. So let us not overlook this one here. When we are asking the sovereign Lord of Lords this request, that we must be ready to forgive as much as we are ready to be forgiven. Next he says, and don't lead us into temptation. So just as you have given us what we needed, forgive us, forgiveness of what we've done wrong, let us also be guarded and protected from all the evil that is around us. Let the temptations of the world, of our enemies, have no control over how we live, how we love, and how we not only model our prayer life, but how we also model how we live our life daily. So may these words not only be easy to say and easy to repeat and easy to offer alongside one another, in corporate worship each week, but also may these words be easy for us to live our life and to live into these patterns daily as we strive to be more and more like Jesus. And as we look into his teachings and live them out as the church body together, but also individually in our own walk. Next, we have the example that Jesus then gives. A lot of times when Jesus is teaching, he gives us great parables and lessons to learn along the way. So to demonstrate this next point, he teaches one of his parables. And in this parable, he's painting a very vivid and somewhat unimaginable scene. Right? A friend comes over late at night. He said it's after midnight. And because that friend is there, it's because he had a friend who was traveling and needed a place to stay. Typically in those days, in the heat, it was so much easier to travel by night so that's why it was um, someone came that late in the day. And it says that this friend didn't have any food to spare, but he remembered that you did. He remembers that this man and his family had some extra food. And in those times, a lot of people, they live so close in community that they share meals together. So it's, it's going to be easy to remember who had the, the Tupperware container full of leftovers and who didn't when mealtime was over. So he remembers, oh, you had some leftovers. I don't have any, so I'm going to go to you in the middle of the night. So he came to you in a time of need, persistently knocking on the door. Now the persistence here comes from the fact that even though all the excuses are laid out for why he's not going to open the door to this friend in need, the persistence of the friend being there will stick. So first of all, this, this man says that the door is locked. And he says, my children and I are in bed, and I can't get up to give you anything. Those are the three phrases he used as to why he was not going to help this person in need. But the persistence comes through. And it says that you would eventually give in because your entire neighborhood would know that you're not opening the door for your neighbor. Now that could be a whole sermon for a whole other day. Doing things so that others see you doing them. But a commentator, John Pilch, says this. He suggests that a better translation of persistence due to the culture of Jesus' times would be the word shamelessness. But look at how faulty and false all these excuses the man gives as he quickly dismisses his, his original excuse and moves on to another one. Remember, he says the door is locked. Well, he's known pretty good and well that he was the one who locked the door, and he could certainly be the one to unlock it. So he then goes on to say, well, my children and I are in bed. Already admitting that again, that he could get up and unlock it, but he blames it on his kids because they shared probably a one-room house and everybody was in there asleep. There might even have been some of their animals in there. And when you wake up kids and they start screaming and the animals start doing their things, it's just going to be loud and then everybody's going to be awake. And it's getting well past midnight. But... Again, he knows he can do that. He knows it'll be okay. It's not the end of the world. He wakes his kids up, wakes the animals up. He then immediately says, well, I just can't get up to get you anything. Skipping past and the laziness and the blaming that he did for his children and just simply says he just can't do it. He doesn't want to. It's inconvenient to be bothered like that in the middle of the night. And I 
believe here that Jesus is emphasizing this persistence is not to say that God must be bothered to the point of being nagged, to being shamed, or being annoyed. Rather, that persistence is to show that we must show urgency and seriousness and boldness in going to Christ and going to God and asking and if and when it aligns with God's will for us, then God will delight in giving in to those requests being made. You see, God is not like that of a vending machine where you can go and pick and choose what you want and he immediately gives it to you. Or for those who remember Robin Williams' voice, the blue cartoon character, a genie back in the day, I'm not going to give you your three wishes and give you whatever you want, but it has to align with his will for your life. You see here, God is a loving father. When we look at him as the, with that previously mentioned glory that we started off in our prayer, and we ask him to bring his kingdom here on earth, giving us our daily needs, again, not our wants, church, but our needs, all while we're forgiving while he's forgiving our sins and we model that forgiveness to others while continuing to lead us away and protect us from the temptations of the world. When we are aligned, then God's will and desire for us will come through and he will answer us day or night. So after Jesus teaches this using this example, he also gives us a question to think about. So to drive home this point, he poses this question that he often does. It puts it into our perspective. How would we view these things? So in verses 11 and 12, I'm going to reread these verses, but in the message translation interpretation of the Bible. And in that it says, if your little boy asks for a serving of fish, do you scare him with live snake on his plate? If your little girl asks for an egg, do you trick her with a spider? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children. So I'm going to ask you a question and pose a question here for you today. Who here has ever asked for something for their birthday or Christmas and gotten what they wanted? Who here has asked for a specific gift and your parents or loved ones, grandparents bought you that item. Now, my kids will laugh. Uh, my in-laws a couple years ago framed one of my wife's Christmas lists when she was seven years old. And um, I think it got damaged in the move, but we'll get it reframed. But it goes on to say that she wanted all kinds of things. She wanted not only a horse, but also a pony, so she was one, one of each size. Um, but there was this, this certain wish list that she had, and it was so outlandish that uh, it deserved framing from some years later. But what a reminder it is that we often get what we ask for when it comes to gifts and presents. Now, I'm going to tell a little outlandish story of myself. So in my best Sophia impersonation, I want you to picture it. Canal City Mall, December 24th, 1990. Now, this was a few months after a debut album had dropped, and after my attempts of recording this hit single off of the radio from one radio to another, whoever remembers doing that, you know, you get that radio announcer talking in between, and you know, there was all kinds of mess. But in the midst of my tape that had songs such as You Can't Touch This by MC Hammer, Another Day in Paradise by Phil Collins, and who could forget the ever classic animated hit, Do the Bark Man from The Simpsons? <laughs> this album that I wanted to own, the real version, not the recorded from the radio version, was that of Vanilla Ice's debut album, To the Extreme. <laughs> so here I was, remembering going to the mall. I had asked for this tape for months and months from my parents. And here I was going to the mall with my uncle, who at the time was a bachelor, which explains why we were at the mall on Christmas Eve. <laughs> so he may or may not have waited until the last minute to do his family Christmas shop. So here I was at the mall, and I, I don't know if I'm getting this album for Christmas or not. So I'll ask Uncle Charles if he'll purchase this cassette for me. Well, this is also to date myself. My Uncle Charles then decides to find a payphone. For those that know what that is. 
go and call his mom's house, with where my mom was at, that's where the family gathering was at, and ask if he could purchase the tape that I found closest to it. I was just grabbing whatever came about. Little did I know that uh, less than 12 hours later, I would be unwrapping that very cassette that I wanted. Now I say all that to say this, as bad as we humans can be, as much as my parents were probably so upset with me for having the audacity to ask and go behind their backs for this gift, I was still able to receive it the next day. So to stress that, as bad as humans are, as bad as we all can be, after all it's in our nature to sin, Romans 3.23, Paul tells us that, that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Jesus still points to the fact that even those who are inherently bad and sinful, we still give our children good names. He asked for a fish, he didn't give them a snake. He asked for an egg, or she asked for an egg, and didn't get a scorpion or a spider. So if we, as bad as we are, won't do that for our own kids, how much more? Church? How much more and how much better of a gift will the God who created us Give us, if only we ask. His word says, everyone who asks receives. Whoever seeks, finds. And to everyone who knocks, that door will be opened. Church, we are called to be like Christ in all that we do. So let us start by answering those who ask us about our faith and why we believe. Let us start by helping those find when we see or hear them seeking for help. And let us start by helping open the door for others to a new relationship with Jesus Christ when we see them knocking. And as Paul told those in Colossae, in Colossians 2, 6-7, he says, So live in Christ, Jesus the Lord, in the same way as you received him. Be rooted and built up in him. Be established in faith and overflow with thanksgiving, just as you were taught. So let our prayer life and the life we live out be rooted and built up in Him, established in our faith, and let our prayers and way of being overflow with that Thanksgiving church, just as we were taught through Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ has taught us not only how to pray, but again, how to live a life of gratitude, and He has given us in return what we need, church, and that is His Holy Spirit. And that same Holy Spirit that empowered those disciples many years ago to do all the great things that's mentioned in His Word, church, that is the same Holy Spirit that is here with us today, that is calling us to share with all of God's people. So may we continue to find ways to help those see, know, and love their Heavenly Father, the one that we call upon. So church, will you join with me in the Lord's Prayer as we say these words that Jesus not only taught his disciples long ago how to pray, but that he's teaching us today how to pray as well. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And church, would you stand and sing our closing hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer. And at this time, this altar is always open if you need some extra prayer.
As you go forth, know that you leave with the unfailing love of God. As you leave this place, know that by God's strength, you will be able to face the challenges of the coming week. And as you return to your daily lives, know that your pursuit of peace reveals to the world that you are God's children. In his name I send thee.